try to convince yourself that every mission could potentially go bad. But I do remember Breton feeling a little extra dangerous. There's a detonation, and it's just immediately shocking. I heard uh, screams of a wounded ranger at the top of their lungs. You know, my heart sank. I knew that we had hit an IED, and that was big trouble. That mission changed me. I'm never going to be the same person. We got sent to Kandahar, Afghanistan, in 2009. We were going to be there for a few days, pick up the slack from a, another platoon that was having some issues. You know, we packed for two days, and two days turned into about 30 days. And we were all living in this big platoon tent. We were just jammed in there, maybe 40 of us. We felt like, man, we're going to be here all this time with like three pairs of socks. Everybody would have their own kind of partitions built off, and you'd find a way to manufacture some privacy for yourself. So you really don't see those guys almost every waking hour. The days that we went on missions, they went by quick. You know, the days that weren't, you know, you really got to, to kind of relax and, and f you know, try to, try to unwind a little bit. You know, the boys are off, you know, getting chow or going to the gym or doing whatever they, they want to do to, to, to relax in their downtime. Everyone had their own rituals. Some guys would play um, Xbox. I read a lot. I tried to just keep my mind busy all the time. I had a couple best friends in my platoon. Rob Sanchez was one of them. We were both kind of short. So a lot of guys in battalion are six foot plus, and we were both like little 5'8", 5'9", guys. He was just a character, man. He was, he was always trying to make light of the situation. He could, like, hold 10 guys' attention and just make these guys laugh. Thrived off that stuff. He was a, you know, he's a big personality. He would, he would easily joke with a group of guys in Ranger Battalion. And that, that really was his role in the platoon. You know, you always need guys to fill certain roles. Rob knew from a young age he wanted to join the military. When 9-11 happened, it really affected Rob. I want to say he was in middle school, maybe eighth grade, and he was just like, you know, that's ridiculous. How can they do this to our country? So I think that was maybe always in his head. I mean, you know, for Halloween, he was either three things. He was a ninja, a soldier, or a zombie. Those were the things, and more the soldier than anything. The summer before he graduated, he did his research. He looked all into everything, like with the SEALs and the uh, Marines. He enlisted and said, you know what? Rangers are me. That's where I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to be part of them. And so that whole year, he trained. I mean, and I mean trained. Like, his little brother was five, four or five at the time. He would put him in his backpack. He would walk around with this little kid, jog down the beach. I mean, people would tell me, you're a kid, man. What's he training for? When Rob did something, it was 100%. It was all or nothing. And love was that, too. He, he loved his family. And his friends, the Rangers, they were his brothers. They worked together, partied together, fought together. They, they were just inseparable. For Rangers, you're in the same platoon for years. You live and grow with these guys. You do everything together. You're going out together. You're training together. You know, the, the group. There's always something going on. There was this guy named Remsburg, and uh, this dude was always plotting something. <laughs> you always had to lock your stuff up around him because I'm pretty sure he would, he would take it. When he showed up to our little circus tent, he had a projector, he had his computer, he had an Xbox. So he brought all the stuff for the guys to use. I'll never forget about this other guy, Tori. You know, Tori's just that little fiery Asian kid from the inner city. He had these weird idiosyncrasies, like he hated 
the word bitch. The worst thing you could do to somebody, in his opinion, was calling that word. Uh, we became pretty close over there. You have all this personal and emotional investment in all these people around you. You know, it's not just a job. It's literally, literally being a ranger, it becomes your life. Objective Breton, we were looking at going into an area of Afghanistan called Panjway. Panjway was kind of uninhabited by the coalition troops at that time. So we're sitting there planning, looking at graphics, looking at all those things, watching the targets, seeing what's happening. Can we identify weapons? Can we identify anything? You know, inf information is, you know, it's as good as ammunition. We were watching through surveillance some individuals gathered around a campfire, looking like they were having a meeting. The main person we were going after was a facilitator of some type of network. It was either, you know, explosives or finance. Those are the big things. As we target that network and try to destroy it from the top down, we eliminate a, a large uh, infrastructure that's hard for them to replace. You know, the enemy started moving, but they were dropping little, you know, groups of guys off at these, these road junctions and intersections. It was obvious that as we moved, we were going to be engaging the enemy at each one of these guard posts. You know, my spider sense was tingling at that at that point. As we were getting ready, you know, I'm usually first one at the ramp, counting everybody on, make sure we have a good head count. This is a spot I like to be on. I enjoy flying in helicopters. It's really hard to describe what it's like to fly in over empty darkness. On your way to a target, flying 100, 150 feet off the ground. You're kind of the master of all you, uh, you uh, survey. When I joined and I was going to be a ranger, I didn't really have these grand goals. I didn't plan on being a leader of anybody. I was just happy to be a ranger. I remember like the, the Marines or somebody or the Army was was at my high school, then my sophomore junior year, and they had this big, like, you know, inflated drill sergeant thing. And uh, my wrestling coach told me that I couldn't do it. And I'm standing there kind of like imagining my future, and he walks by and he and he just looks at me and goes, That'll never be you. I didn't say anything, but it it obviously has stuck with me to this day. I mean, many years later, and so a big part of it was proving to myself and then just to just to prove people wrong. Mike was uh, one of those guys, You, when you initially look at him, you think, uh, I don't know if I want to approach this guy necessarily. He's covered in tattoos, and he just had this intimidating look about him. But you know, you get to see the human side of everybody after a while, especially when you're in some situations, everybody's vulnerable at some point. You built relationships that were, were both, you know, at times you had to be heavy handed, with discipline and other times you you could joke but there had to be that line i took being a leader to heart you know i wanted to be close to my guys i wanted to know everything about them but you know if you have to order a guy to do something that you know requires their death you don't want him to go look at you and go like you know but you know hey sarge i thought we were i thought we were buddies that that can't be we were gonna land somewhere around midnight and we wanted to be out of the area before sunrise. It gives our aircraft the best cover from ground fire and gives us the safest passage to and from the target. So whether we're walking or flying, uh, the nighttime gave us the best opportunity to be safe. You get the one minute call inside the aircraft, you're, you're one minute off from the target. So if if your buddy's you know, asleep next to you or something, you give him a good, a good shove. The adrenaline starts pumping a little bit you start getting information from the targets. 30 second call comes out. And the ramp lowers, your field of view starts to expand so you can start to see, see out. You hit the ground, bird settles. You get the command and go, you, you on snap and, you know, weapon up. You're running off that bird into unknown.
on objective Breton, we found it was best to land further away and uh, try to use the element of surprise. We landed in a field that was a slight brownout, which is common because of all the dust and dirt. Uh, and the rotor wash from the aircraft is, is so high power that, that all the dirt gets kicked up in the air and it's hard to see. You're in the middle of a field, so you're a little exposed. You don't know how many people heard you fly in. I mean, there's two huge helicopters just landed in this field, so people know you're there. So I remember taking an east and a perimeter. You kind of settle there, and there's like a a long pause, you know, of, of quiet, and everything is, uh, there's no noise. Everything's silent around you. Just listening, but you're stretching out with every possible animal instinct that you have to find something that is looking for you and to find it first. I do remember Breton feeling a little extra dangerous. We knew the potential for getting into some firefights was a little elevated that night. From there, we moved right onto a road that ran through the village uh, with walls about five feet tall on both sides of the road. Everything has walls, and the roads have walls, and then it's just orchards and overgrowth. It's like these little feudal towns, and it's an old place. Like, every time I was on the ground there, I'm just, you know, I feel like I'm <laughs> transported to the Dark Ages because that's what everything looks like to me. It's so rural out there. You don't have, the, like, all the ambient light of the city and stuff. So when it's dark and the moon's gone, it's dark. I mean, you can't see your hand in front of your face sometimes. It's so dark. Rob Sanchez was an alpha team leader. Alpha team leaders are always the, the, up, the, the front fire team. Because we had to walk on these roads, guys are staggering offset with roughly three to five meters between guys, and that's going to stretch out from the very first man to the 50th man. So you're looking at a order of movement of this whole assault force that's stretched out over 300 meters or so. One thing we did not see was another outpost position, and we were ambushed immediately. It was like, you know, really? Like, this is happening now? OK. You know, and it's just like immediately engaging into you know, that next level of, of alertness. We're up against walls. You can't shoot through your buddies. It was difficult to return fire. You had this really small window that you could shoot through. I was pretty much stuck there, so I just got tried to get as flat against the wall as I could. One of our snipers was shot. Shane managed to, like, crawl through a cut in the wall. I knew I had to run across this path, so this fire had ceased. So I just sprinted over and got through that break in the wall and found him laying there. Brian was our medic, and we were on the ground for 15 minutes, and he already had his, you know, his hand's dirty. It's not how you want to start a mission off. The weapon that the enemy fighters were using malfunctioned, and that's why, you know, we didn't take more casualties. I went through my trauma assessment, you know. You immediately look for stuff that's just pouring blood or, like, something that's going to kill the guy within the next few minutes. Based on the way he was talking to us, we suspected that he was probably fine. But we're not surgeons, and we don't have x-ray vision, so... Uh, we gave him the benefit of the doubt, and we tried to get him out of there as soon as we could. We got him treated and packaged and ready to go within 10, 15 minutes. One thing you realize as a medic is that 99% of the time, everyone just forgets you're there. And then that 1% of the time, you all of a sudden, you're the most important guy on the battlefield. I was a pretty bad high school student, so I used the Army as kind of a catalyst for change. When you're a 17, 18, 19-year-old kid and you're only responsible for yourself, you learn how to live a certain way. You know, for me, all of a sudden, I was 19 in ranger school, and uh, I felt like I had to, I had obligations to other people. It takes a while to sink in that you belong here. You, you almost feel like you're always proving yourself. Um, I felt that way for years. 
You're with these like unbelievable infantry guys and they're so good at that job. And you feel like as a medic, you're at the opposite end of the spectrum. The job's to kind of go out there and preserve life. So you kind of have a little bit of a personality crisis. And that's your life day in and day out. You get very comfortable with it. You get comfortable with that level of a performance. And you just, you know, that's what's expected of you. And that's what you expect out of everybody else. After this near ambush, you know, we had our aircraft above us start really searching the areas around the road for any other heat signatures or possible targets in our way. The enemy at the next place hadn't, hadn't moved much, so the party continued moving forward. We still had a lot of ground to cover that night. With the gunfire, we knew that it was a good possibility that the enemy heard it, they know what's happening, and that they're ready. That night, as we were walking into the target area, the mood was on edge because a lot of us didn't want to stay out there any longer than we needed to. Upon our movement, we came across some tree branches, standard tactics that the Taliban would use to you know, show the locals that there's an IED buried there. Um, so we knew the area could be very, very dangerous. As a road funnels or narrows, it directs traffic in a, in a predictable manner. So if the enemy thinks that they can predict our movement, then they can place devices in our way that can hamper our movement. That night, my job was to clear those hazard areas before they pushed across them. Alex would go do his thing, hunt around, you know, places where it would make sense to put a bomb. For him, it was really about knowing the tendencies of the enemy and what they were doing. Well, someone's got to do it. I mean, I felt that if I was trained in it, then I would have the best options or best ability to, uh, to avoid those hazards if possible and prevent others from doing so as well. Explosives fascinated me. The electronics, the amount of ordnance that, that, that's out there. I mean, there's you know, hundreds of thousands of different items. Yes, you're taking a lot of risk, but you're, you're trained properly and you know uh, what to look for and, and how to avoid some of the mistakes that you know, others can't. I was injured in, in training early on and never made it to battalion. But for me, the idea of, of, of being in the 75th Ranger Regiment was a big thing. And so uh, when I became an explosive ordnance disposal technician, uh, there was an opportunity to try out for a special operations unit that supported them. So uh, I took my opportunity. It can be tough when you come into an environment where, where the guys have been training and working together for years. And uh, you're just kind of thrust in there and have to prove your worth quickly and show that you're not a liability. It takes time, it's just like any, any relationship. In combat, you're, you are looking out for a lot of things, but having someone that really knows how to spot, identify, you know, IEDs, how to disarm them. It's a great addition to, to any platoon, and Alex was so good at his job. You know, you knew that you could trust this dude. You knew you could trust him in combat. I think we all sort of feel like he's protecting us. In a, in a lot of ways. Like, this guy is encyclopedic about bombs and explosives and, like, the, the methods in which they're rigged up and the ways in which they work. It was impressive. The enemy pushed the envelope in Iraq uh, with the technology. Uh, Afghanistan, they reverted back to lesser technology. It was cheaper and it was harder to defeat. Five dollars, you know, you buy a couple batteries, you got a couple pieces of wood, you can make a pretty crude circuit that it's hard to find and uh, it's just as easy to function. With explosives, it's initial success or total failure. Especially when you have hazards like this, the prices you pay are in blood. We determined nothing was placed at this tree, so we proceeded on past all our uh, potential hazards, you know, safely. We reached an intersection where we knew there was enemy fighters. I think it was three, three to four guys we thought were just kind of hunkered down within those trees in some kind of defensive position. So we moved in, 
Corey moved out with first squad, which was the squad that Rob was a team leader in. They kicked out to a flank in a way to set up clear, clear fields of fire. We got one of our interpreters to come over a bullhorn from a, a covered position and speak, uh, you know, posh to, to these uh, supposed fighters. You basically just ask the guys to come out. Um, this is a way to, like, try and defuse the situation. One of them got scared, shot at us, and that told us all we need to know about that situation. After everything settled, you know, the shooting stops. Those guys are were, were probably dead. Um, we had to obviously check. You go through the bodies, checking them for any sort of sensitive materials. I remember finding like a, it's like a toothbrush. Well, not it wasn't like a toothbrush, but that's what you used for. It's like a stick with like wax on it. You like you go through and you find all these personal items from these dead uh, enemy combatants, and it's it's a. It's interesting to go through a dead person's pockets. At the site, there was four machine guns. There was a number of magazines, approximately four hand grenades, and night vision devices. We wanted to destroy the weapons and the explosives. So uh, I started to build an explosive demolition shot to destroy the enemy equipment. At this point, the sun was starting to come up. So we decided, OK. We've got some good stuff out of this. I think um, we should we should try and get back to the base while we still can. I'm looking back towards the rest of the platoon, you know, just kind of scanning around. And then this, you know, explosion goes off. There's this long, uh, <laughs> a very quiet moment. And at that point, everything seemed to be very slow. I thought everything was okay. As much as I was stuck in this quiet pause, I was quickly ripped out of it. As I heard the screams of uh, a wounded ranger. That was the first time I heard just someone screaming like that. standing at the road intersection. You know, we were just having this conversation. Man, that was a crazy mission. I'm glad it's over. And then boom, like 10 car crashes at once. But you could feel the wave come off the blast. There's just chatter everywhere. Stuff's coming over the radio in my headset. I could not see into the blast area because there was so much dirt. First thing I saw was a squad leader. He came sort of out of this dusty thing, came into view, carrying Tori. He put him down, and then he ran off to do his thing. And so there I was alone with Tori. The first thing I noticed was that his foot was gone. So he had this amputation on his right leg. It was the first amputation I had really seen, and it was so clean. So your body has this like kind of uncanny ability to close off those blood vessels at first, but that effect wears off. So initially, there's no blood at all. And um, if you let that go long enough, that will become a lot of blood. So I had these tourniquets. Um, rubber banded to the front of my kit. I ripped the tourniquet off and I threw it on his leg, ratcheted it down. He was in a tremendous amount of pain and he was letting me know. He was grabbing the chin strap on my helmet and pulling on it. He kept saying my leg is on fire. I always just wanted to be the calmest guy on the, on the battlefield in that moment. I feel like getting flustered is very contagious. 
you see one guy getting aggravated and then other guys start to feed off that but you know if you look down at the medic and see him very calm very stoic very deliberate going through his process you can feed off of that too it turned out to be a mass casualty situation i remember walking in that perimeter and seeing a lot of the guys faces still kind of coming out of the, the group shock of that. Mike was Rob's squad leader. And, you know, I looked him in the eyes, and it was just so wide-eyed and just, just kind of in shock a little bit. But he was, you know, still moving and executing, but just his facial expression was so pronounced um, in a state that I had never seen him in. Some dudes that had light wounds were kind of, you know, treating themselves. All this chaos around him, Alex is in that crater, you know, collecting all the intelligence he needed to pass it on to somebody else to make sure, you know, they didn't do the same thing. I sweep up and make sure the guys aren't sitting near any other devices because you can expect that when one IED is planted somewhere, there's probably multiples. You know, if you hit one, you have to send people down there to get your casualties, you're gonna hit more. You know, we were able to consolidate all of the personnel to get the casualties out of there as quickly, as safely as possible. I remember my junior medic seeing a, a boot with a foot in it still. And he said, hey, do you think that's Tori's foot? And he comes back with this kind of weird look on his face. And he was like, it was a different, it was a different boot. It wasn't Tori's foot. But I had just seen a guy with his leg blown off and another guy that was potentially dying in front of me. So a foot like that is the least of my concerns. At some point, I managed to, like, see the platoon sergeant go scurrying by. And I kind of, like, grabbed him and wanted to know what he had seen already, because I had only been in that one spot. And there was just movement going on all around me. And he said, Remsburg is um, over there. He pointed to him and said, he was in the water, he looks bad. Remsburg had been blown up and over into this creek underneath this culvert where the ID was. They fished him out of this water he had been laying, you know, face down, unconscious. This bomb went off right next to the guy. His helmet was probably up in the trees or something. When I looked at Remsburg, I had to, I had to look for an extra second. The way he was, you know, struggling to breathe, uh, the amount of blood that it was, it was hard to kind of tell who, who was hurt. You see someone that you're used to seeing one way and they're in a completely different fashion, it's, uh, it's shocking. He had this, like, chunk of the earth lodged in his head. There's really not much you can do. Yeah, obviously, you're not going to go in there. I covered it with a bandage, basically. And uh, we started to get him packaged up to move him over to the casualty collection point. We were bringing seven injured guys over there. At this point, it's now, how do we get out? It's daylight. We're starting to, you know, we've, we've called in some reinforcements, some extra aircraft to provide some overhead support, and they started getting fired upon. There was seven to 10 people shooting into the air from their houses and their courtyards and some, you know, wooded areas. So the transportation helicopters are now put in a very precarious situation to fly into a helicopter landing zone that is hot. They found a landing zone that was behind a wall very dangerous for them to do, and it saved us from getting shot at. I was with Remsburg. I laid over the top of him when the bird came in because it blew a bunch of dust. And then the guys picked him up and carried it, and I slept him on the chest and said, all right, man. I thought I had basically just said goodbye to this guy. Um, I did not think there was any chance he was going to survive that injury. I didn't know if he was going to survive the flight back to Kandahar. There was just a short period of time after the helo left that you could just look around and see that everybody was starting to realize what had just happened. It was just a very distinct look on everybody's face. 
Mike looked over at me and said, is Rob dead? And I said, I, I don't know. And then a few minutes later, I started to realize that somebody had triggered the explosion. He was one of the only guys I didn't still see on the ground. So I knew it was him. As our first squad, which contained, um, you know, Rob Sanchez, um, Corey Remsburg, Tori Honda, many other, many other really good rangers. Um, they crossed this footbridge. On the far side, it was, there was like some, some amount of, uh, you know, homemade explosives buried under you there with a crude uh, victim operated, you know, pressure plate. Victim operated is kind of an interesting description, but that's the technical jargon. You're a victim that operates this device. Uh, you know, nobody ever thinks about themselves that way. Um, certainly not a ranger. I didn't. I didn't know. You know, I, I looked around. I didn't see him, so I had no clue. Uh, until I found some goggles on the ground with his name on them. We got everybody loaded up on the birds. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to think, you know. I, I don't remember thinking much. Just, just making sure the guys were good and, and making sure everyone was going to get out of there. And, and I was, you know, lot, you know, first one at the ramp, counting dudes on. It didn't sink in, like, I, I was just so tired on the bird, you know, and just kind of just, once everyone was good, we're flying back. I was just kind of in a slump, just laying there, and everyone was just kind of staring off. We were starting to fly home and getting that kind of, okay, it's over, you know, we survived. I'm still here. This aircraft's obviously a little emptier than it was when we landed. You always want to do something, at least as a leader, to make sure that you know you don't look like you're 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 so shocked or taken aback that you're still in control and that you're still confident. So you just want to make. I remember just trying to look around and just look people in the eye, at least as you know, something you could do. I looked over at Mike and he offered me a stick of gum, which I'll never forget. After all that, there's nothing really we had to say to each other. He just offered me a stick of gum. got back to Kandahar, I went over to just be with Rob for a minute. He was laid out at the mortuary affairs tent. So I wanted to go in and just spend a minute or two with him. We do the ceremony. We'll have everybody formed up. You know, it's the whole boots with the rifle in it and the dog tags and, and helmet. We do a roll call. Someone will call out someone's name that's there and they'll say, I'm here. Do it again and do it again. And then <laughs> and after <laughs> after every name, you know, in, in, inside me was this pressure, this emotion that was building every and I knew, you know, I knew it was coming and they called uh, they called Rob's name, Robert Sanchez, Sergeant Robert Sanchez. And then somebody, you know, yells out, you know, Robert Sanchez is no longer with us. I 
then it really, you know, then it really hits home. Uh, you know, that he's gone and you're not gonna hear his name called out in morning formation before PT anymore. He's not gonna come. <clears throat> you know, he's not gonna come home. You know, it's just, it's done. Got up to speak and made a very sad attempt at a at a eulogy, and it was just mostly you know talking through tears. I wasn't the only one. I mean, everyone was crying, but was, uh, to see that many, you know, from really brave men, just so kind of broken and vulnerable, was kind of you know one person starts and it just goes. It's contagious. At this point, uh, we're doing the uh, the uh, post-mission analysis and, you know, uh, preparing for... Uh, <sighs> so, at that point, we had to load Rob on an aircraft to send him home back to the States. was like the heart and soul of that platoon, you know? He was friends with everybody. The platoon changed. The dynamic of the platoon was, was different. You could sit in that tent, look around, and see empty bunks. Some guy had basically been living off that bunk just a day ago. Guy still lived there. PT uniform laid out for after the mission. Guys had their, like, you know, tennis shoes ready for when they got back. Before Rob's last deployment, I had this horrible dream. I dreamt he was going to die in combat. I said, Rob, I don't feel good about this deployment. And he goes, Mom. And I go, Rob. I've never had a bad feeling. I've always felt him safe over there, like he, he's with the best. And then he said, Mom, I'm your Superman. Nothing can happen to me. That's what he would always tell me when I was, like, mad or upset. And then October 1st, I still dream about them knocking on my door. I'm just sad. I'm sad. My heart's sad. A general said at his funeral, and I, it made a lot of sense to me. Soldiers aren't made, they're born. Rob was, he was born to do what he did. I mean, I think that's how I am able to accept that he did something he loved. How many of us can say we love what we do in life? And he did, he loved being a soldier. Rob was all about the team, and so, I know I'm not the only one that hurts. I know that other people hurt too. But his guys, they were his brothers. I don't know that bond. I mean, I've never been in the military. I don't know what they go through. It's just one of those things you're left with. <laughs> the living must carry on with, with, with those burdens. Um, that the, you know, the dead are no longer encumbered by. That's part of the, the extreme of the human experience, you know, is, is warfare. Even explaining it now, you know, unless, unless you've been there, you'll, you know, you'll never know what it's like. And that is the burden, the burden and the bond of, of people that have been through that. So it leaves its mark on you. I find myself all the time trying to earn every day. I asked Rob's mom several years after, you know, I, how, how do you think I should do that? Like, what do, what do I have to do to make the most out of his sacrifice? And she said, you know, just be yourself. He was your friend for a reason. So just be yourself. Ha, ha, ha.
ground to all four sides of you basically we knew that we were in trouble because there's only one way that we can get back out and then the ridge lines just lit up we were taking fire from everywhere that's when i felt like a punch in the back of the head all medics come to this truck chief's been hit your actions are gonna determine whether or not your teammates live or die and i wasn't gonna let him die i wasn't gonna let him die U.S. Army Special Forces were created in 1952, but it wasn't until 1961 that President Kennedy okayed the colorful cap that gave them their name, the Green Berets. U.S. Special Forces carry out some of the military's riskiest operations. Their work often is secretive. Only about 150 elite soldiers earn Special Forces status each year through the Army's toughest command school. I think the difference with Special Forces is that we're senior soldiers. You didn't have guys recruited right off the street. You had to do some time in the military, and then you volunteered again to be special forces. We usually work in a smaller unit. So because there's less of us, when we go out on missions, Green Berets are exposed a little bit more to the, you know, the local nationals. We're basically put into situations where we have to deal with the cultural sensitivities of other people. But, uh, you know. That's what we all volunteer for, you know, that, that's the kind of thing that we wanted to do. You're motivated by the people around you. You know, we wanted to make a difference in, in our area, because if we're gonna be there for eight months, might as well make it a good eight months. Our team was so dynamic. We had such a great cohesive unit. We fed off each other's strengths and weaknesses. I had a great team at the time. I got the best seventh special forces group. You know, the most aggressive team, the guys that are after it. We're all pretty positive. We're all pretty uppy, but Romy's just one step above everybody else. Romy was the warrant officer, and he empowered us to be able to be the team that we needed to be. I remember somebody telling me that, hey, this is your team. You know, you're the continuity of this group. You're the one that's supposed to hold everybody together. I tried to take care of those guys and made sure that we were doing the missions with everybody's voice involved. That was the number one thing that I wanted, you know, in my head as a commander. Growing up, my childhood it was full of excitement, full of fun, lots of family, friends. I mean, it was, every, you know, everything a kid could dream of. Everybody knew me as bouncing off the walls. My dad was a pediatrician in the Army, and then my brothers, you know, they were served. You know, I thought highly of them, and I was like, when I saw them graduate airborne school, I was like, man, I, I, that's what I want to do. I thought it was the coolest thing. I mean, when I was 12, I, I took a, a brown plastic bag and I climbed the roof of my apartment and went ahead and jumped off and 
on my mom about flipped out. So I don't, but you know, what can you do? As kids, we had no fear. I mean, no fear at all. I wanted to follow my brother's footsteps. So I entered the, the army when I was 19. From there, you just get motivated and go on from one thing to another to another. So I made the decision to go to Special Forces. You know, I knew that we were going to do our part in, you know, in, in what America was doing. And I, I believed in that. But I always made sure that my family was in my heart. And, you know, I, I made sure that I could do my little piece so my wife, Gabby, and my son and daughter could, could live, you know, the great life that we live here in the United States. There is a guerrilla war going on here in the mountains and valleys of Afghanistan. The last time special forces were here, they got ambushed by Taliban, who then slipped away. They know the mountains like we know our backyard back in the States, and we're on their turf now. And as you can see from the terrain here, nothing in central Afghanistan is easy. So in 2008, this was our second deployment into Afghanistan. And at, at that time, we were really uh, gelling as, as a team. We got to Afghanistan, and um, I mean, we, we hit the floor running. And about four months after we got there, and our company was doing a bigger mission um, northwest of us. Higher command decided we would go in and support the, the bigger company mission, but we had to go through this Maidan Valley. That area right there is a major highway of Taliban fighters moving through at Kandahar. Since we knew that there was a village that had been cut off from the main route, we decided to, to help that village out with medical care. They weren't the objective for this bigger, larger mission, but we wanted to be able to provide them with, with something, you know, other than, you know, just being there and occupying, you know. We were gonna go out and basically set up a little clinic at this village and I would treat sick and wounded. And, you know, I'd request a female treatment team to, you know, be attached to our unit because with their culture, you know, they don't, they don't allow, you know, men to treat the women. You know, the, the hope is, you know, when you bring med supplies in that, uh, Normally, you know, they're pretty receptive. And while that was going on, we were going to be looking for the bad guys because another mission was happening in a different part of Afghanistan, a shock or um, uh, commandos were coming in from the south, pushing to the north, and our intel said the enemy would basically, they would run away into an east-west running valley called Maidan. We were actually put in a blocking position so my job was to, you know, provide fire. And the thing about Afghanistan that's different from Iraq and other locations is just the terrain is just so treacherous and so dictating on your movement. At the mouth of it where we entered, there's a, uh, you know, a suspended footbridge probably 30 feet over the Canyon River. So you drove under that thing and, uh, so that's how tight it was in there. And then once you pass that, it kind of opened up, but there was, you know, high ground to all four sides of you. It's a, basically a box canyon. And the only way we'd get through there, because the river ran through it, was to bring a, a bucket loader and actually build a road through the river that uh, we had to be able to cross to get up in there. talk about special operations that is kind of a unique unconventional movement really and we were able to get into an area that no one else has really been able to get into by utilizing that bucket loader the canyon was basically a, a river area with lots of vegetations you had farm on one side uh, tilled fields on the other Lots of almond trees, lots of lots of vegetation. You know, pr pretty difficult area to move through and, and fight in. When you're there, 
and you're, you know, doing these missions, you know, you plan and you prep and you take every step to ensure that you guys are going to make it. But you always have to be prepared for an unsuccessful mission. You can do the best you can to survive, but you can't control everything. So, September 15th, 2008, our team 7115 packed up and went ahead and left to go execute our mission in Minot Valley. It's very difficult to get into uh, that area right there because it was one of the major routes that Taliban fighters used to get into Kandahar. I had a 12-man team. I had a, uh, a female lieutenant colonel, uh, registered nurse, and then we had support personnel. The guys that were supposed to secure our convoys, and those are Afghan security guards. We also had a, a platoon of infantry with us as well. Uh, so uh, we, we had quite a few vehicles with us. You know, we had very aggressive guys. We had some very senior guys on the team. Steve Hill was a very senior uh, medic in the military. Steve, being the medic and being one of our snipers, he brought a lot to the table. I was a soldier before I became a medic. I didn't think of myself as, you know, I'm a medic. I'm, I'm a warrior. That's what I'm here, that's what I'm doing. I'm here to, you know, make sure that all my, my brothers come, come back alive. My father, he was a Vietnam veteran and he, was a great inspiration for me. So I was kind of a military brat in the early part of my life, and uh, I moved around a lot. I think 13 times before I uh, turned 18 and joined the Army. Because I moved around a lot, I didn't always end up meeting the right people. You know, they have this cadence in the Army, and it says, go to war, go to jail. And it was kind of a situation like that, believe it or not. I did well through basic training, and. Uh, I just needed more. I didn't really know as much about special forces. I just kind of always had a, a feeling that that's what I wanted to do. I actually got to my team in 2006, and that's when I met Romy and Ian and everybody else that was part of the team. And once you start doing your training together, that's kind of when you start building that bond. You start realizing that these are the men that you're gonna have, your left, your right, while you're in combat. I think because I moved around so much and I don't have those roots and those people in my past that it's so important to me now. And that's why that team forever will be my family. That night, September 15th, we went in and, you know, received fires right off the bat. We were at this part right before entering the mouth of the valley, and we made our first contact. I remember they came at with a, a lob of RPG rounds. And I just remember being in the turret and, like, looking and seeing the RPGs just coming out of the mountain. Some of them were air bursting, some of them were duds and skipping and hitting the ground, some of them were, you know, detonating on impact. That was just the beginning of uh, that mission, and we were pretty much in contact the entire time, fighting our way to get to that position to support the larger mission. Right before we got to this one particular part, uh, I remember looking and seeing the tracer rounds around the vehicle in front of me. thinking to myself, those guys are toast, they're done. I was a Mark 19, which is a grenade launcher, and I turned the turret and shooting a can of Mark 19 rounds up, you know, where we're receiving fire, trying to suppress the enemy. When 
once we had suppressed the enemy and we pushed out security elements and stuff, I, I jumped out of the turret and I went up to the truck and uh, there wasn't a scratch on anyone. Everybody was fine. Their vehicle was Swiss cheese. All four tires shot out. The radiator, you know, got shot out. We've been lucky. You know, we had guys shot between the legs. Missed everything. We had a guy that, you know, got, he got hit with an RPG. You know, nothing happened. You know, it's all about luck, I guess. I don't know. loader was moving up to the, uh, the far end of the canyon to cut the road for us or to help improve the road for us to get our vehicles up in there. About three quarters of the way up, they, the Afghans had dug this uh, irrigation-like trench. And it was large enough to where we weren't capable of driving our vehicles over top of it. So we get the bulldozer, and the bulldozer you know, scoops up some earth and rock, and it's driving up the side of the mountain, and it goes and drops some stuff inside this uh, irrigation ditch. As the bucket loader was clearing the, the road and the path, it kind of tiptoed on its, on its side and rolled over. And this 18-ton, you know, bulldozer comes crashing down on top of itself. And uh, we were stuck uh, at that point. You know, we knew that we were in trouble because we kind of have the ability to hear the enemy. They use radios sometimes that we're capable of, you know, intercepting their transmissions, and we have interpreters. And all of the interpreters were like, hey, they know that the vehicle is down, and they're calling for all the fighters in the region to come to this area because there's only one way that we can get back out. I think it's uh, pretty late at night at, at this point when that bucket loader rolled down the hill. And where we were in that box canyon was the village that we wanted to, to provide the support to. but. Uh, at that point, it became a recovery mission of the of the bucket loader. So we never really pulled the you know the medical supplies out to give to those people. At that time, the mission kind of changed because now we have a, a big hazard that we have to take care of. There was no way we could recover that piece of equipment. There was no getting it out. You know, you're not going to get a crane back there. You're not going to get helicopters in there. It was done. The problem is we've got to secure this bucket loader until the command decides whether we can uh, destroy it in place or what we're going to do with it. So, uh, and of course, we also have the follow-on mission. We were not in a great spot to support. However, we were still within striking distance. Ian was great because he knew his job. I mean, without a doubt. He was directing the, the Afghan National Army and police um, and constantly staying on top of us and seeing what we needed. And it made him great to be with, especially in situations like that. I was the oldest guy on the team in 1987. I was 20 years old. I had just left college, uh, decided college wasn't for me, and uh, decided I was going to do something different, so I joined the military. I just walked into the recruiter station, and that's what happened. You know, Special Forces never really entered my mind. I mean, they were the guys down the street at Fort Lewis, Washington, that wore, you know, Green Berets, and you had Rangers there, too. Um, my friend came back from Desert Storm and said, I'm going to join, I'm going to go to Selection. And I said, well, I'm going to go, too. So the next week, I volunteered to go to Selection, I went. Years later, I volunteered to go to the 7th Special Forces Group. And uh, I became the team sergeant, which is basically in charge of uh, all the enlisted men. You know, you've got leaders that, you know, when they get in those stressful situations and they're frantic and they can't control themselves and they're all over the place. And 
he wasn't like that. Ian was very, very, very calm and cool. He's just always very, very low stress. Ian was, you know, great, a great team sergeant, and, and I remember everything he, he did for the team. You know, it's just, you know, team camaraderie, 12 guys living and working together, and, and you know, every day. You know, that's your family. So after the bucket loader rolled, we had some Afghan forces with us who we sent to the high ground to uh, secure it. And then Romy and I cleared the, uh, the high ground uh, villages up there. So we were able to secure the canyon pretty, pretty well. And then uh, we basically waited the night out to see if we got called from the uh, other uh, unit uh, for support. So we stayed there until the mission was complete, basically. I want to say it was about eight hours until we finally got permission to blow this thing up and return to base. So uh, Romy and uh, uh, Ruiz, our engineers, who are explosive experts, uh, they went up there and they, you know, rigged the uh, bucket loader with explosives. We needed to make sure that it was destroyed and that the enemy couldn't end up, you know, taking it apart and then reassembling it. We strapped a lot of explosives to it and blew it up to where all the pieces would be inoperable. We decided to return to base because that was a lot of explosives to blow that big a piece of equipment. You know, we had just made a big signature and we drew a lot of attention to ourselves. And I remember as we were pulling out, the, the ambush kicked off. It was like 4th of July. started to leave with all our support people with the Afghans we of course we had to bring them off the hill uh, so we started moving people out of the high ground we had to move the infantry platoon back as well I was in the turret of one vehicle and Romy and my best friend Ramon were in the other vehicle and me and Romy were just talking about going to bike week and going to Sturgis and like all the things that we wanted to do when we got back from our trip and I remember as we were pulling out, the, the ambush kicked off. The ridge lines and mountains just, just lit up. It was about 25 to 30 insurgents at the time. They were coming from the wood line in the village, the high ground. It was pretty chaotic. RPGs, rifle fire, AK-47s all over the place. You can see the tracers, the green tracers, red tracers, I mean, all around us. I grabbed the interpreter that we had who was with the nurses. I told her to go in the front seat of the Humvee and to put her head down because things were gonna get crazy. I always made sure that if anything ever happened, I tried to be out, but... We were taking fire from everywhere. You could hear rounds cracking past your head. They are hitting a vehicle. We were taking fire from both ridge lines. Steve Hill was actually having trouble uh, firing through the, the trees uh, because they were already in the river. I'm sitting there next to the, the water, and I look down, and uh, one of the... Uh, one of the females that we had um, brought with us, uh, Sandy, um, she was a, a dental tech. She was on the 240 machine gun, and she was just getting down. And I remember her shooting, and I was looking at her, and I was like, that is a warrior. And, uh, you know, she was firing rounds, and then 
you know, she ran out and she was in the process of changing. And I remember looking and all of a sudden in the water, I could see bullets hitting the water and the water was splashing and it was coming right at our truck. I remember, you know, telling everybody to take cover. And as soon as the rounds went over the top of the vehicle, I just turned the turret and I'm like, just tried to line up from where those rounds went. And I just started throwing grenades down. I was about to enter the river. And so I was still in that, that area right there and was able to drop a couple mortars. I'm returning fire and I had to reach down to grab some more, two or three grenades. And then all of a sudden, that's when I felt like a punch in the back of the head. That's the only thing I remember from that part. I heard the call that Roman was shot, and they need all medics to his truck. All medics come to this truck. Chief's been hit. As soon as we got the call and we were the vehicle right behind him, we were there. I mean, we're talking 30 seconds. Our vehicle pulled up right next to theirs. So I was in the top of our vehicle. I jumped out and into the back of their vehicle where he was shot. And then that's when I started um, doing my, uh, my treatment. I saw Romy in. Well, there's blood everywhere. I don't know, you kind of, that's the one thing about the training that we do. We're constantly, you know, just training, 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 training to when it comes down to actually doing it, it's almost like muscle memory. It's like a reflex. It's happening so fast that you don't even realize what's going on. There wasn't a lot of room to work in the back of the truck. So I was actually straddled over top of Romy. He was laying on his back. And uh, I took my, my hearing protection out so I can listen for breath sounds. And uh, I cut his body armor and stuff. And I was going through my treatment protocol. And we originally thought it was a glancing gunshot wound, like it just clipped him. It actually, it came in the left side in his hairline. and. You know, when we're there, we're usually, our hair's long, you don't, you know, you, you grow your beards out and stuff, trying to fit in with the local populace. And uh, so you couldn't even see the entrance wound. Then when I did my initial sweeps on him, I didn't even know. But I just knew because it was a gunshot wound to the neck, I'm assuming there's C-spine involvement. Your C-spine, it goes through the spinal canal. And if, Something's moved, you can cause more damage. So I said, maintain C-spine until I tell you otherwise. I knew that he had to have an airway. And if we were to intubate him, that would have required us to, you know, change the position of his head, which if we moved his head back like that, then all of that spinal cord damage, it, it probably would have severed his C-spine, he would have died. I wasn't going to let him die. I wasn't going to let him die. Romy wasn't breathing, and he didn't have any uh, vitals. He didn't have a pulse. And I remember I was getting ready to make the cut on his neck. We were taking some heavy fire from the rear, and uh, and Reese, he, he turned and he just lets out this like 20 round burst right over my head. And a 50 cal machine gun has a overpressure that's just, it's crazy. And I remember I looked up and he's looking down at me and I say, give me five seconds. And he nodded like that, and he turned off, and he started shooting to the front. And I looked down at Romy, and I'm like, please, God. And I made the initial incision. I didn't have any crike, anything, no tray cooks, nothing, just the razor blade and an ET tube. And I take it, and I 
I, I passed the tube in and, I, and it felt felt right going in. I'm like, all right, it's passed. And I got a placement. I got the bag and I'm having to straddle him, bag and give him air and then engage the enemy until we could fight ourselves to a safe location and actually call for a medevac bird in. Of course, as soon as we, you know, circled up in that open area, um, my gunners all sat on the guns and, and were firing at the uh, at the high ground. And then we went over to uh, Romy's truck. When I looked at his eyes, they were leathery, black leathery. You know, Romy's dead. We're all in there, you know, cussing Romy out to breathe. You know, breathe, breathe. And, uh, and he did. And I remember seeing his chest rise and fall, and then immediately his co color started coming back. Steve saved his life. And when he gasped that, that breath, I mean, it just, hey, man, he's, he's going to make it. But even though I had brought him back, because of the level of his injury, he couldn't breathe on his own. So we tried to stabilize the neck as best we could, you know, trying to lift him out of the truck, keeping his head, you know, stabilized, and then getting him on the ground. I remember telling the junior medic, I was like, your sole purpose inside so you otherwise is to maintain proper alignment. We were still taking fire at the time, and it was another mad minute, you know, because we wanted to flush out all the bad guys. And we were on the side of the vehicle, and I was prepping him for transport. And Romy had given up his position in the TC seat, which is the passenger seat of the vehicle, an armored vehicle. So he had a spot where he would have been safe. And he gave that spot up for one of the female interpreters. Her name was Soraya. I remember as I was packaging him up, I saw Soraya <laughs> just looking down at Romy. Just tears coming down her eyes. I looked at her, I'm like, it's gonna be okay. And then, uh, then the bird came in. The medevac, they didn't want to come in because we were taking direct fire. They didn't want to come into a hot LZ. The medevac must have said, we're gonna land no matter what, because they came in. If you'd see the canyon where they had to land, and knowing that we were taking fire up to the last minute, uh, I'm surprised they landed. And uh, right as the bird was coming in, they're like, you're going with them. I remember looking out the side of the bird as we started to pull out, and the team starting to move on again. And I remember seeing the ridge lines, and, the, and I remember them shooting you know, their machine guns and just taking a moment and praying and saying, God, please watch over them. And uh, I looked down and Romy's got his eyes opened and he mouths to me, what happened? And uh, of course, <laughs> I was a wreck and I was like, you got shot, dude. I was like, but you're okay, you're stable. We're, we're getting you out of here. You're gonna see your family soon. And uh, I just remember him, he always does this thing with his lips, and he goes like that. He closes his eyes. Birds left, you know, everything was quiet, and we, uh, we, we went ahead and finished expilling it to get everybody out of there. And uh, with mixed emotions, you know, that we got him out was, was huge. But you know, we, we still didn't know whether he was gonna live. after Rummy got hit, and we stayed back to make sure everybody got out of there uh, in an orderly fashion. The mission was complete, basically. Later on, uh, you know, we were getting all sorts of rumors, you know, so he, he's doing all right or, you know, but you still, 
prognosis was that I don't think they were sure that he was going to live until much later, until almost when he got to Walter Reed. I received this phone call from one of his teammates um, asking me, hey, Gabby, um, how are you? And I was like, yeah, I'm good. Why? But immediately, I felt something weird. I mean, I was cold and shaking. I remember asking, is he alive? And he said, we don't know yet. The actual injury was pretty bad. It, you know, that's when we found out that the trajectory had gone across the backside of his C-spine. He had spinal cord damage. I drove from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., to Walter Reed Medical Center. His brother, I remember that he said, Romulo, he, he's paralyzed. And he, he's looking really bad. They took me to, the, to his room to see, for the first time, my husband. When I came to and I see Gabby next to me, I thought I just died and gone, gone to heaven. Well, by that time, our son was 18 months old. And I say, Romulo, who, look who's here, Andres. And he was smiling. He was so happy to see his son. And uh, I say, you know what day is today? And he said, no, today is my birthday. And he was like, wow, happy birthday. And I say, uh, and you are my best gift. Well, at the time, you know, I, I was just happy, you know, to, to be there with them. In my eyes, I thought that six months top, I'd be out. My spinal cord would would get better, and I would be, I'd be back. When they told me I was replaced on on a team, I think I spent you know a good couple of days thinking about thinking about it. What am I do now? The first time that his teammates came to the hospital, and I remember seeing all of them around his bed. It was like ten guys uh, kissing him, hugging him. I've never told so many so many men in my life that I love them or kissed men in the cheek as much as I do those, those guys. They were there, I mean, supporting him. Hey, bro, don't worry about it. We're going to be with you. I went down with all the guys. Actually, uh, we, we came back, and, uh, you know, it's, it's emotional. You know, it's, it, it was bad, but, you know, Gabby stops you at the door and says, you know, it's all right. The first three years, I think, after he was wounded, uh, it was difficult for me to go visit him because I didn't know if I would have wanted to have been saved and live in the condition with the disability that Romy has. I had, uh, I guess, survivor's guilt. You know, Forrest Gump. Remember Lieutenant Dan? I should have died on the battlefield. I was supposed to be a war hero. That's what I thought, that's what I thought. I thought, you know, maybe that's what he wanted. But after time and seeing the things that Romy was doing and seeing that even though he was disabled, he was living. He was living. Life doesn't stop. You know, you, I still have to be father. Still have to be a husband, a brother. And I don't stop. He's a real warrior. And he say, you know what? This is not gonna stop me. I'm gonna keep moving, Gabby, you will see. They say no, but they don't have the last war. There's a lot of wounded vets that have come back and they haven't had the support that Romy has and they haven't recovered the way Romy has. And they've lost their families and they're depressed. You know, they need help. I know for a fact that if I didn't have Gabby or Andres or Alina that 
I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. You know, I'd probably be depressed or, you know, sitting there all medicated, you know, wondering how the hell I'm gonna drive my chair into a pool. I always say this, paralysis is not an individual issue, it's a family issue. Gabby, being who she is, said, you know what, Romy, let's open up a rehabilitation center here in Tampa. And, you know, we decided to call it Stay and Step. It is a program with a sense of family. I feel fortunate and blessed to have been a part of all of it. And he wants me to come work for him, you know, and be a trainer and be a part of that and, and help other families recover. You know, if God picked somebody to lead other people to walk, he picked Ranger Camargo. I'm here today because of those guys, and to me, they're just, they're all my brothers. That's what being SF is about. You know, you love the guys on your team, and uh, you've got to have that tight bond with them. And that, you know, that's, that's, that's what you do. You know, that's your job. That was the beauty of that team. Everybody knew what their job was. It's almost like nothing had to be said. Everybody just knew what they had to do. And that is what made it so amazing. I'd do it all over again. Wouldn't change a thing. I don't even think about it. is immune to the effects of war. It doesn't matter, you know, what your upbringing is, how tough you are, how badass of a seal you are. You have to accept you're doing an inherently dangerous job and people die. War is violence, right? Once you've experienced that, you know, it never leaves you. Like, it's always there. War, you know, it's confusion, it's chaotic, it's, it's disgusting, you know, it's, it's all the worst parts. Trying to understand that? I mean, people have been trying to understand that for, for millennia. Ramadi in 2006 was the hotbed. If you had a heat map of conflict going on in the world, you've got your hot fire red, that was Ramadi. Ramadi was like, you know, take like a dirty city where they have all the abandoned buildings and then throw some garbage on it and light it on fire. And that was Ramadi. It was just dirty. It was bombed out. A lot of the infrastructure was damaged. Uh, it smelled like gunpowder mixed with, uh, like rotting flesh. It was a very hostile environment, a very unforgiving environment. Most of the insurgents in that area just had a run of the land. There's insurgents running around, torturing people, planting IEDs, and not just attacking Americans, but their own people. And Team 5 was there to take out the trash, essentially, to get those bad people out of the picture. Knowing that it was the most dangerous place in the world. That's where we all want to go. It's something we feed on. You want to go to the fight. Guys want to employ their training, and they want to make a difference. 
We fight for America, but you know, your brothers are the most important thing. The guys on the left and right of you, those are the guys that really, you know, make why you're out there important. My name's Mike Sowers. I was at SEAL Team 5, and I was a point man. A point man is the person that walks in the front of the patrol, figuring out the routes to the target. Usually the first person that's going to come in contact with any enemy that's going to attack you from the front. My name's Dave Hancock. I was a comms guy. You're the guy on the radio, getting all the information from various like sources, and you're painting a picture to the people who can't see it. My name is Mark Matz De La Flor. I was on Team 5 as a sniper and assaulter. There's definitely a lot of different personalities in a SEAL platoon, and I think that's what really brings a SEAL platoon to what it is. There was this guy, Rob Guzzo. As soon as Rob checked in and he was going to be a comms guy, I mean, we just hit it off right off the bat. Like, we were just laughing all the time. Rob is a guy where if you met him once, you would never forget. He was a walking holiday. It's like the feeling you get like when Christmas is around and there's like this warm warmness around and you're just happy. It was like very positive energy. He's just got like this high pitched laugh. <laughs> like it goes something like that, like <laughs> and and you would just start laughing. Rob was a total jokester, which is awesome, but at the same time he was serious. You know, his his parents were both military and he had this sense of pride. Rob, as a child, was uh, always very active, and he liked to make people laugh. His father was very athletic, being a Navy SEAL, and so Rob got a lot of his natural athletic ability from his father. He was around the SEAL teams, so he got to see it firsthand, and I'm sure that was planting that seed then. When Rob was 9, 10, Bob was a buzz instructor and would take Rob frequently to the SEAL training compound. Sometimes we'd go to the pool, and I'd give him a little spin in the water, and of course, he was all game for it. Once I realized he was comfortable with it, I said, well, let's try tying your hands up. He goes, all right, let's go for it. Then we did the hands and feet tied, and he uh, loved it. There was nothing that he wasn't willing to do or try and give it at 100%. He's always been the guy's guy that everybody wants to be their buddy. His younger brother, Aaron, and then his other siblings, you know, they all just idolized, you know, Rob. He was, you know, he was the big brother. After he graduated from high school, he ended up going to State University um, of New York in Cortland, New York, was where his father went. He played football like his father, and his father was in the Beta fraternity, which Rob joined there as well. So it was kind of, as time went on, it really looked like he was following his, his dad's footsteps. When he decided to join the Navy, it was on September 11th. I was stationed at the Pentagon. I put in 27 years in the United States Navy, and 25 of those years with the SEAL teams. So fast forward now to me getting orders to DC as an anti-terrorism officer. We are sitting in our office that morning. You could literally feel the uh, building shake. And there was no doubt in our minds what was going on. By the time we got in there, it was just, you couldn't even recognize it as a building. It was just total chaos. I called the fraternity house. The first thing he said when he picked up the phone is, my dad OK? And I said, he's fine. And he just, like, broke down in tears. You could tell he, he was moved by it. He says, I want to do what you did. I was like, Rob, you've got a degree. You can go in as a commissioned officer. And he's like, no, you know, I want to go in at the bottom. I've seen how people respect you. Because I, I enlisted and then got a commission halfway through. And so I said, you know, all right. You know, I was just so proud of him. With the world affairs, the way they were moving, I knew Rob was going to certainly get deployed into a combat zone. So when uh, I heard that Rob and his platoon was going to Ramadi, I obviously was concerned. Everyone knew Ramadi was extremely volatile. It was very hotly contested. It was controlled by the bad guys. There was just so much combat and so much death of American forces. I remember thinking, this just got real. 
I mean, this is, this is not playing around. The reason we were in Ramadi was to bring about a certain amount of order and control to a chaotic scene. It was just such a violent environment over there. And uh, I mean, it was a very tough environment to fight in. I mean, the buildings were literally touching each other. There's a lot of channelized terrain. You're constantly looking around 360 and 720, so you're constantly looking up. Alleys, windows, doors, each window is a threat where someone could be hiding, they could shoot from, engage you from. So you needed to have a lot of communications between uh, the troops. Dave's coming up. You can ask guys, hey, what's the biggest weapon you carry? You know, and guys make, oh, you know, a 50 cal sniper rifle or machine gun. No, it's your radio. It's the biggest weapon you carry. If we're in a firefight, that comms guy is your voice. The comms guy is the one that's going to bring in support, reinforcements. The comms guy is basically the guy that's going to save your butt. So then it's up to you to be sure that you have positive comms at all times. On several occasions, I mean, you'd have to uh, like go outside on the roof and expose yourself just to actually get positive comms. A lot of times we would be on our back, just kind of, it's kind of like skedaddling along the roof like this with an antenna up like this, like, hey, <laughs> hey, can you hear me now? This is Red Bull Six Romeo. Be advised, troops in contact. Dave is our head communicator for the platoon. It's one of those jobs that's not as sexy as being a sniper. You know, when you're a kid, I don't think anybody wanted to be the little green army man that was holding the big radio. But it's so important. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. I was a three-sport athlete, so I played football. I did indoor track. I played lacrosse at college on a scholarship. I was in the teams for 13 years. I joined up in 2001, right after the attacks. Just seeing the smoke from my mother's place uh, just kind of did something to me. At the armory, there was flyers everywhere, as far as the eye can see, for families, if they hadn't heard from somebody who worked in the towers. And I looked up, and there was this older lady. She was probably 60. She had climbed probably about 15 to 18 feet up a power pole because she had a flyer of her son who was in Tower One. But she refused to post that flyer over anybody else's flyer. Just out of respect, um, she did that. Yeah, that, that was probably a defining moment in my life. I wanted to do something to have an impact. And I didn't want to wait. I wanted to be the best of the best, and I wanted to go fight. Dave had a, a serious side, because he would get so focused in, laser focus on what he was doing and making sure everything was super perfect. Dave was kind of like Rob's mentor. Rob was an assistant communicator, and Dave definitely ran a tight ship. A lot of times, me and Rob would be up for, you know, four or five extra hours after a particular op, changing all the radios because we're going to be in a different battle space for the next operation. We do comm checks with every guy, with every truck, and with the actual battle space commanders, because it all boiled down to one thing, make comms. Rob didn't take that lightly at all, that he was responsible for the safety of all his brothers. I remember seeing Rob in his element and really, uh, you know, being a master of his craft. You got like nothing yet. Clear, man. We were doing an Overwatch mission. There was weapons being moved in a mosque. Our whole task unit that was out there set up in different positions to monitor this insurgent activity that was going on. Dave, we're gonna go peeking towards our position. Copy. Hey, be advised, OP-1 has a looker to the north. Now copy. From building number? Building 7. Probably that look of building seven. It was a pretty big operation. I think we had three separate elements just with our SEAL uh, unit. And there were several other Army units out there. There was a Marine unit. Red 
The Moss started putting out uh, a call for, for blood, which is a call for people to come and fight. And we just started taking heavy fire. And hit the fan, like. I was on the roof with Rob trying to deconflict where the different elements were at. Well, the last location, building 19. And we had a map of the area. We were trying to figure out where the fire was coming from and what was their positions, asking Rob all these questions. I mean, it was just bang, 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 bang. I mean, we're just dropping people left and right, just shooting them, killing them, because they kept coming out. But then we want to get out of there before things turn really south. So Rob was in charge of getting all his guys out of there. OP one and two, move your extraction. You guys move first. We'll hold over watch. Copy all. Copy all. Break it down. Break it down. Let's go. Break it down. We had elements in different buildings, so we were cross covering each other. Rob was coordinating the extract vehicle, where the vehicle is going to come in, what's going on in the battlefield, where rounds are coming from, where bad guys are at, who is going to move when. That's a lot of crap to balance. Like, we have, what, 50 guys out there? And there's rounds going every which way. Opens one and two, break out as a go. Those were the last guys off of target. So they were overwatching our two elements as we were moving to extract. I was in the same element as Rob, so we were the last ones to leave to move to the truck. This whole time, Rob is on the radio. When he's not shooting rounds, he's listening the entire time. Rob was responsible for the safe extract and the safe operation of, you know, 50 plus guys at once during a massive engagement. And he did a phenomenal job. At that point of the deployment, things were still, still real, real hot. We were doing a great job of maintaining the infrastructure and integrity in Ramadi. But we still knew it was a very uh, dangerous place. You know, one of the greatest things is like, you know, just being in a really terrible situation. You know, you're just hunkered down on the ground and you can just look over at the guy next to you and he just looks at you and smiles and laughs. Rob was known for trying to break up the monotony on missions. Uh, one of his classic uh, moves was to tell a knock knock joke. Like, we're actually hitting this building, right? And like, we're clearing the building. It's a very serious thing. And the doors don't open, he looks back at me and he's like, knock, knock. 
And I was like, wait, now, here, now? Are you, like, really, now? He's like, knock, knock. And I was like, who's, who's there, what, who? And he's like, Theodore. And I was like, yeah, okay, Theodore who? And he's like, Theodore's locked. <laughs> he said, hey, do you know what time you go to the dentist? And I said, is this a joke? And he says, yeah. I said, what time? He says, 2.30. He said, what? He said, 2.30, get it? 2.30? I said, yeah, Rob, that's terrible. <laughs> when a joke cracks off in the middle of something like that, it, it kind of makes you take a couple steps back in your mind. And so I think it actually has an actual real benefit beyond just being uh, humorous. Rob and myself were in the same tent in Camp Markley. One of the Christmas packages that came for Rob had this little uh, polar bear, and he'd press its hand and it would light up and do a little dance and sing the uh, the stop, collaborate, and listen. Ice is back with a brand new invention. And uh, we like every time we'd come back, we'd go to that and just like press it and watch it, press it again. Like became like a ritual, you know. Like every time you come back, you just. And we'd sit there for, you know, five times and just play that thing, this stupid little polar bear that would just, like, gave us so much joy. So it's like a little piece from the outside world in this, uh, in this war zone. Mats is, he's very laid back, but when he needed to be, he was a very intense guy. Mats was a sniper, and a hell of a sniper, too. He was wired into his craft. I grew up in New Hampshire. I was the only child. Growing up, I'd just always be running around in the woods, like climbing the mountains, snowboarding, skate. I did a lot of skateboarding, sneaking onto people's property, mischievous stuff, you know? The most military exposure I had in my family would have been from my uncle, who was a Marine, who I looked up to for sure. You know, so I started researching the military. You know, I found team guys would blow shit up and go after people, you know? So I thought that was pretty cool. So we were sitting in a building, and we got compromised at some point in time. I remember hearing, doo -doo 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 -doo. they lobbed a couple of grenades up on the roof. We had guys on the roof. They tumbled down the stairs, like, holy shit. that was close, you know? But then, like, somebody had to go up and get all the gear because like there was still gear, like there was guns and uh, like belts up there on the roof. And so Rob kind of heads it out the door and there's literally like the unexploded grenades. All their old grenades are pretty nasty and trash. All their fuse timers can just burn real slow. So like, you never really know when it's gonna go off. It can not go off for like three, four minutes and then just boom. There's literally like a grenade. It's unexploded ordnance. It's sitting right there, but it doesn't have a spoon on it. All the guns were on the other side of the roof. And Rob just, he's just kind of like, like he looks over at me and smiles and he's like, doop, 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 doop. And he kind of does like a little dance and then he kind of just hops over it, like just kind of giddy. You know, he goes to that side of the roof, he grabs that stuff. I cut over to the right and I grab the stuff over here. And then he's just kind of laughing. He looks back at me and he's just like, You know, just kind of playing around. I'm like, get inside, you know, what are you doing? He's like, oh, that was interesting, you know, so we just kind of finished up and went about our way. He didn't hesitate. He knew that we had to go over there and get that, and, and he chose the, the most perilous route. He chose the one that was going to keep me safer. So to me, that personifies warrior. I mean, Rob's uh, the most loyal guy you can get. No matter what, he's going to support you because you're his bro. When he went through BUDS, I was an instructor. So it was really cool, you know, to be able to think like, you know, hey, I, I've just put this guy through training. And to be able to see, you know, Rob evolve into a uh, highly trained warfighter, it was a really rewarding process. 
I grew up in a small town in uh, central Pennsylvania called Port Allegheny. Grew up hunting and fishing and played sports. The worst thing you could do to me as a kid is make me sit in a chair for five minutes. I think I was about 15 or 16. Uh, one of my older brother's friends told me he was in Navy SEAL training. He's like, we're like a, a wrestling team that carries machine guns and blows stuff up. So to me, I was like, that sounds great. I was in the Navy for 13 years, and I was a SEAL for 11 years of that. Mikey had been on a lot of rotations before, so he had been there and done that. I had a good respect for him already when he came to our platoon. He's a, he's a fun-loving type of guy, you know, in addition to just being a good pipe hitting team guy. President Bush heard from his top military brass at the Pentagon Wednesday, who have urged him to boost the number of U.S. troops assigned to train the Iraqi security forces. About midway through deployment, our main focus had begun to shift to support the Iraqi police. But I don't think it was to the point where the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army themselves were able to hold it down without a U.S. presence while we deployed. Ramadi, it did get better, but it was constant maintenance. So we were constantly being like pulled out to go and assist on these particular missions. And they happened all the time. Like, there was a school, and some suicide psycho decides to go like blow himself up while school's in session, but took out like the equivalent of a busload of school children. I don't care how hard you think you are, like the first time you see one of those kind of aftermaths. You know, like the dust hasn't even settled yet. The smell of explosion, I mean, it's still rampant in the air. It kind of resets your, <laughs> I'd say like your level of, of what's just like utterly disgusting in the world, you know? You know, guys like Rob and Dade had to report on what's going on. As a communicator, you have to get very intimate, you know, with the environment around you. So, like, you have to say, well, so far, we've identified that there is at least 11 children. And how do you identify, like, 11 children from a mass suicide bombing? Well, you identify them by body parts with different, like, pieces of clothing on. I mean, being a comms guy in that particular situation, things would be a little bit closer to you because you were having to, like, hear it, and then you are having to, like, talk about it. That kind of puts it on a, on a different level. I remember Rob having to go on a few of those. He was visibly just like, what the, f like, what, excuse me, like, what? You know, and I think, I'll speak for myself, like, you never really understand, like, you never really come to grips but that answer, you know, it starts, starts weighing on you. The enemy in Ramadi was uh, pretty into uh, using kids. What I thought was just disgusting was the use of kids for the intent. They know that people have soft spots for kids, and they'd exploit that. They'd try to leverage them to carry things for them to move weapons or explosives or even to set up attacks. It's such a war-torn country, and, you know, most of these kids, it's like, you know, they don't really have long-term goals. It's really hard to understand as an American. They grow up in a war zone. Like, war has been their life. So we were on a target, like, right in the middle of the city. <laughs> like, we got attacked on three different sides. Guzo was on the second story window. Moving in the alley. But one of the guys attacking was a kid. He was like a 10-year-old kid, eight, 10-year-old kid. But he was dressed up. He was dressed up like a full-blown 25-year-old attacker. You know, he had his chest rack. He didn't even have his AK on him. But he went to pick it up. I know Rob didn't want to, 
but I mean, he had to make a decision. Do I do this? Because he's going to pick it up. Do I not do this? Do I do this? to make a decision you know and several of us have been in that, that same situation you know like and you wait until the last possible second you know to protect himself and his brothers you know he did what he had to do in the seal teams we try to inoculate you to any situation possible but the real thing is is always the real thing I couldn't imagine that there was anybody out there who wanted to shoot an eight-year-old kid. But when that kid's pulling a trigger and rounds are flying towards you and everybody around you, that kid is a significant threat. Having women and children be part of that enemy uh, combatant group, I don't think you can prepare yourself for that. After six months time and you've been doing stuff every day, he gets to that over it type of feeling. It's kind of like you're revving an engine, full tilt, the engine starts letting you know that you need to cool it down for a bit. Everybody was like there for one goal, to come home feeling like we had changed something for the better. When we left, things had become dramatically less violent. At the end of the deployment, I would see like kids and women would be outside in the streets. So I think we took that as a sign of success. When we came back from Ramadi, it was kind of a changing point in the war. You know, it was such violent fighting. They brought in a few doctors and psychiatrists. Basically said, hey, if anybody you know, needs to talk. It was more of a volunteer thing, though. I, I'm not sure if anybody took them up on that offer. I know I didn't. It was just kind of like, SEALs don't get PTSD. But uh, you know, going through a deployment like that, it doesn't really matter uh, how much experience you have under your belt. I think it changes everyone a little bit, at least. When Rob came home from Ramadi, his eyes were just dark, and it was like looking into abyss. He just wasn't the same person. War is a constant thing. So your chemicals in your brain, your, your adrenaline, it's, all, it's elevated. And when you come back, it's almost like a dullness, right? Because you're not experiencing things at those levels. So things can kind of just seem just blah, you know, like just drab. Rob, in his attempt to adjust, just started drinking a lot, never sleeping. And I think when he did sleep, he had the nightmares. And I remember one time he's laying there sleeping and his legs are running and his trigger figure is doing this. For years, he would either call me or his father in the middle of the night and he would just want to talk. He would cry. A lot of times he would be intoxicated and that just, just became you know, our routine. If you don't get any sleep, like you're, like you really can't heal like mentally. It just gets worse and worse. It just tumbles, you know? And then you drink it to go to sleep. And then that turns into like four or five drinks a night just to go to sleep. And then before you know it, like, yeah, now you're pounding bottles. It gets, you know, it's, yeah. When Rob started having these problems, we knew we had to get some kind of treatment uh, for him. But he insisted he did not want to do it through the Navy chain of command. That if he did, it would impact his ability to continue being a SEAL, which whether it was true or not, if it was in his mind and he believed it, then that's where the truth is. Rob eventually 
saw a psychiatrist and he was diagnosed with, you know, a variety of different uh, things, including, you know, PTSD, you know, anxiety. PTSD, it's like a, a, a silent disease. It just affects people differently. We all have this, like, black cloud. I've seen it in myself. It's just like this mental state. There's sunshine behind the cloud, too, that you can get to, but sometimes that cloud just consumes the sun. It's a, it's a mix. I think it's a mix of, you know, what you've experienced in your past and what's going on currently, and then also when you start thinking about into the future. Rob went through the civilian treatment and then also got into the military treatment, but he was still having these little setbacks. But those issues started to become uh, farther and farther apart. After he um, got out of the Navy, started working towards a master's degree in kinesiology. He was doing well and, and enjoying it. And uh, he was informed that he was a father. He eagerly accepted it. It was very encouraging, very loving to see that. And again, it was kind of a shadow over the fact that there was still that, that issue that was unresolved. That day, Rob had just got back from the bar, maybe like, you know, two, around 2 AM. So I, I woke up and came out, and I was like foggy-headed, drowsy him and a couple buddies, you know, he's talking to uh, the Marine buddies there about uh, combat and stuff. Um, so eventually I went back to sleep and uh, the next thing I know, I get uh, one of the Marine dudes busted in my room. Mark, I need your help. I need your, I need, I need you to come out here right now. I come out of the bedroom and I see, I see Rob, you know, sitting in the chair. The first thought in my head is, he's doing a prank on me right now. It, like, there's, it doesn't make sense. There's no way this is real. I like nudge him, say get up. And that's when I notice the reality of the situation. I got a text. Text just said, uh, Hey, do you know Rob Guzzo? I was like, yeah, yeah, I know Rob, what's up? And uh, the person texted back and said, uh, he lives in my building. Uh, I think he just committed suicide. First, I was in disbelief. We just texted back and forth uh, two days before that, and uh, we were talking about football. It, it just took me back, I was so surprised. Mott's called me that morning. I'll never forget. I'll never, it'll never be out of my head. I'll be there for the rest of my life. It struck me into the heart like I've never felt before. Mott's called me. I said, I said, Rob's dead, shot himself. And I was just like, what? Like, couldn't put it together. Couldn't wrap around it. Yeah, couldn't wrap my head around it. We went to the funeral home, and I told the funeral director, I said, you know, I, I have to see him. Because he had put the gun in his mouth. It, you know, it was, it was, you know, the exit wound was, you know, on the other side, and he just looked so, he was so beautiful. And I just went up to him and just was, you know, stroking his hair, and, um, you know, I kissed him on the cheek, and I just said, honey, it, you know, it's okay. You know, it's okay. I mean, it's one of those things where you always look back and, and you always think, like, you know, if there's more you could have done. You can kind of do the what ifs all the way back. Um, but at the end of the day, there was, some, there was some perfect storm type of situation that happened where you unfortunately, you don't have, once you make the decision, there's no way to undo it. It's a very permanent decision. Yeah, man, I don't think you can blame yourself. You know, like, you can wish that 
Man, I wish I, I wish I had picked up on some subtle change or. But I mean, I wish I had for sure, absolutely, because I miss him, but. If he was here, I would just tell him we're we're very sad to to see. I just say I miss you, brother. I miss you, brother. I miss you, and I love you, and I'll see you on the other side. his presence, you know, his, his, his the holiday, basically, right? I miss that. And I just tell him I love him. And to think, oh, damn it, you know, his dad and I had 60 years, almost, of Navy service. And we freaking could not save our son. But there, it, you know, there is hope. And I think things are getting better. I think, you know, the PTSD and the, you know, traumatic brain injury, the invisible wounds are starting to be more and more accepted. There's so many veterans that are struggling. And so my goal is to help other veterans. I volunteer now uh, with the organization America's Mighty Warriors. We pay for the treatments that are currently not available at the VA. The biggest one right now that's getting a lot of attention and showing a lot of promise is a hyperbaric oxygen therapy treatment. The earlier you get treatment for PTS is the more likely that you'll be able to manage it and rebound and, and have a successful, productive life. Any veterans out there that think they may be suffering from PTSD, get help. And if this gets out to just that one person who's struggling, and yet here's what we're talking about, and, and says, well, wait a minute. You know, there is some hope there. And I really hope somebody, you know, watches this and can be like, he was a fucking all-star, and he was hurting. You know, and so they could say, well, that's, it's OK that I'm hurting. So you get a kind of, uh... Keep yourself in check. Be aware that you're not invincible, no matter how badass you are. There, there's no one that's invincible. Everyone's mortal. Enjoy life while you have it. <laughs>